Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Thank you for joining our last session uh, under these uh, fundamentals of organizing and writing academic research paper. So this is the first series that uh, all of you have, uh, have come uh, for this session. And uh, we, we hope to organize more of such session. So today's session is to continue from our last session, which we talked about the discussion section of the uh, academic research paper. Today is in our lesson nine, we are going to focus on the conclusion and all the other important aspects that you also still need to know. So that will conclude our nine sessions uh, that we started uh, on 11th of February. For those of you who have been very consistent, to either come live or even seeing the recording. Uh, it's, it's congratulations to you for, for being able to make it this far. So today's session again uh, will be handled by both myself and Ms. Pairo Nizan. Prof. Uh, Brian will not be around today. Uh, so we will both handle the session uh, today. So the focus today is very much to look at the conclusion section what are the things that you need to know when you write the conclusion section of the paper, and then the other additional aspects that is needed uh, even after the conclusion, your, how do you design your appendices, your references, making sure your proofreading of the paper, uh, your, your language that you use, so all the other support, especially when we talk about library support. So, so let me take you through the first part of the presentation before I hand over to Ms. Fairo Nizan. Uh, defining uh, conclusion. So the conclusion, uh, remember, is intended uh, to help the reader uh, understand why your research should matter to them uh, after they have finished reading the paper. So a conclusion is not just a, a summary of your points or a re-statement uh, of your research problem, but it is actually a synthesis of um, all the key points uh, in the article. So for most articles, um, one well-developed paragraph may be sufficient for a conclusion, uh, but it depends on the publication. In some publication, uh, you may have uh, two or three paragraphs to conclude uh, the whole uh, publication. So it depending on, on the paragraph. But if you look at most uh, science-based paper, you will only see one paragraph to conclude the whole uh, section. So uh, why is it important uh, to have a good conclusion? So we see uh, a good conclusion will provide you with several important uh, opportunities to demonstrate your overall understanding of the research problem, okay? So you want to demonstrate this to the reader. So, so this will include a few important things. The first one here, presenting the last word uh, on the issues that you raised in your paper. Uh, if you remember, uh, when we talked about introduction, just as in the introduction, it gives a first impression uh, to the reader, the conclusion actually offers a chance to leave a lasting impression. So by highlighting uh, key points in your analysis or findings. Summarizing, uh, another important aspect is summarizing your thoughts and conveying the larger implication of your study. Uh, conclusion also answers the, the so what question. So now that you got this result, what does that mean? So this question is placed within the context of the past research. So you refer back to the literature. This is your finding. What, was, what is in the literature and how do you react accordingly? Is it supporting your literature? Are you against your literature or are you bringing in a new approach in the finding. The conclusion is also important uh, in terms of demonstrating the, the importance of your ideas. It's going to elaborate on the significance of your findings. Um, so, so conclusion is, is not just trying to show all the data. So what does, 
what is the value of these findings, okay? Whether to the theory or whether to the practical application. So a conclusion is also to introduce uh, possible uh, new or expanded ways of thinking about the research problem. So this does not refer to uh, uh, introducing new information. So remember, we talked about this before. You don't introduce something new in the conclusion. Okay. What I mean by new is totally out of the research problem that you are discussing. You can have a new findings, but not a new, uh, a new solution to a different problem. Okay, so you need to offer a new insight and a, a creative approaches uh, to that current research problem, and not come up with something else. So you got to be very careful what you're presenting in conclusion, because sometimes when you read some paper, you read the conclusion, they say it's totally out of what was researched in the paper. So you got to be very careful how you frame your conclusion. So when writing the conclusion uh, to your paper, you need to follow these general rules. Number one here, state your conclusion in clear, simple language, because it's an, it's an important chapter and you want to ensure that everyone understands what was the findings. Do not simply reiterate your results or the discussion. If you've already done that in the results section or discussion section, don't repeat the same information in your conclusion. Uh, you need to indicate opportunities for future research. As long as you haven't already done so in the discussion section uh, of your paper, if you have done that in the discussion section, don't repeat that in your conclusion. So the, the function of your, your paper's conclusion is to restate the main arguments. It reminds the reader of the strength of your main argument and reiterate the, uh, the most important uh, evidences supporting those arguments. So you need to ensure uh, your conclusion is not simply a repetitive summary of the findings because this reduces the impact of the argument uh, that you have developed in your article. So don't repeat the same information, the discussion, the result, and then the conclusion, the same thing. So if the argument or point of your paper is complex, then you may, uh, you may need to summarize the argument for the reader. If uh, prior to your conclusion, uh, you have not yet explained the, the significance of your findings, or if you are proceeding uh, to, to introduce what was the significance of the finding, you can do it now at the conclusion section. So you need to move from, uh, from being very detailed to a general level at the conclusion level. Don't go to the detail in the conclusion section. So the conclusion actually provides a place for you to, uh, to uh, persuasively and, and succeed, succeedly, very briefly, restate your research problem. Given that the reader uh, now has been presented with all the information, so you can now make a good conclusion. So strategies to help you uh, move beyond merely uh, summarizing the, the key points of your research paper may include uh, some of the points that you see here so that you can develop a more uh, compelling uh, conclusion. First one here is uh, if you see if your essay of your paper uh, deals with, uh, with a contemporary problem, you may want to warn the readers of the possible consequences of, uh, of not attending to the problem that can be part of the conclusion. You can recommend a specific cause or causes of action deriving from the findings. You can cite um, a relevant quotation or expert opinion uh, to lend authority uh, to the conclusion you have reached. So, uh, so you can actually refer back to your literature and say, based on the literature, this is your finding. So, but you have gone against what other researchers have done. You can put that as your conclusion as well. Um, restate a key statistics or fact or, or visual image to drive home uh, the, the ultimate point of your paper. Okay, so there's certain statistics that comes up strongly. Restate that in your conclusion because that is the strongest point if you have. If your discipline uh, encourages a personal reflection, if you see a lot of qualitative papers, social science papers, they allow personal reflection. Then you need to illustrate your, your concluding uh, points with relevant uh, narrative drawn from your, from your own life experience. 
Uh, you can also return uh, to an anecdote, uh, example, uh, or quotation that you introduced in your introduction and to support your findings and then baseline it with what you have started off in your paper, okay, in the introduction. You, you can also provide some take-home message, okay, uh, in the form of a strong, uh, concise statement that you want the reader to remember about your study. So remember, your aim is what? I want to leave a lasting impression. When someone reads this paper, this is the last thing they're going to read. You want them to remember what was the finding. So you don't need to write too long-winded until people are lost at the conclusion. Problems to avoid. So what are some of the important problems you want to avoid? First one here, failure to be concise. As I've said, the conclusion section should be precise and concise, straight to the point. Conclusion that are uh, too long often uh, have unnecessary details. Okay, the conclusion section is not the place uh, for details about your your methodology or your results. Okay, all those areas have its parts in the other section that we have discussed over the many weeks. Although you should uh, give a summary of what was learned from your research, this summary should be relatively brief. Okay, since the emphasis in the conclusion is on the implication, evaluation, insights that you are making based on the research, not a summary. So second, failure to uh, command a uh, command on larger or more significant issues. So this is another problem. In the introduction, uh, remember your task was to move from general, okay, to specific, okay, which is your research problem. But in the conclusion, it's opposite. Your task is now to move from all the specific results that you got, moving back to general. So it's slightly different how you write. So how your research contributes, uh, new understanding or fields, uh, an important gap in the literature can be highlighted as well. So in other words, the conclusion is, is where you place your research with a larger uh, context, not micro. Next failure to uh, reveal problems and negative uh, results. So negative aspect of the research process uh, should never be ignored, okay? Your result can be negative. Your outcome can be negative. Doesn't mean that you uh, avoid discussing it. Problems, um, drawbacks, and challenges encountered during your study should be included as a way of qualifying your overall uh, conclusion. If you encountered negative results, um, findings that are validated uh, outside the research context which, uh, in which they were generated, you must report them in the results section of your paper. But in the conclusion, use the negative result as the uh, opportunity uh, to explain how they provide information on which future research can be based. Okay, so you know that's the problem. So your future research can actually tackle that problem. Failure to provide a clear summary of what was learned. So in order to be able to uh, discuss how your research fits back into your field of study, you need to uh, summarize it briefly and directly. Often this uh, element of your conclusion uh, is only uh, a few sentences long. That's why they, so you want it to be very brief. So one paragraph, two paragraphs the most, or three paragraphs, but not too much. Failure to match the uh, objectives of your, of your research. So often you see research objectives uh, change while uh, the research is being carried out. You may have planned something and then you mention your objective in the introduction. As you do the research, your objective sometimes will change slightly. So this is not a problem, but if you forget to go back and refine your original objective in your introduction, then it becomes a problem. That's why we keep saying introduction is one of the last chapter you will, you may write it first as a first draft. Once you have concluded your study, go back to your introduction, reread it and see whether is your objective still valid, okay? Uh, have you accomplished what you plan to do in the research? If not, make the changes or else your introduction and your conclusion is not going to match one another. Next one, resist the urge to apologize. So this is another thing that you see a lot of researchers uh, does in their conclusion. If you are so immersed yourself in, in studying uh, the, the research problem, you now know uh, a good deal about it. 
perhaps even uh, more than uh, your whoever is guiding you, your professors or your tutor or your mentor or whoever experts. So nevertheless, by the time you have finished the writing, you may have you may be having uh, some doubts about what you have produced. Uh, but don't doubt it. So don't undermine your authority by saying something like, uh, uh, this is just one approach to examining this problem. There may be other much better approach. So basically to say that your approach may be not as good. Do not ever say that. In research, there's no right or wrong. It's just how you, you justify the findings, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Don't, uh, don't overstate the obvious. Avoid phrases like, um, you know, in conclusion, in summary, in closing. You don't have to say that in the conclusion chapter is understood. Normally you use these phrases uh, uh, when you are speaking orally or you're welcoming or you're doing a presentation. But when you're writing, you don't have to say that. So readers can see uh, uh, by the heading that this is the conclusion section. So, so you don't have to say the obvious when you're writing uh, this section of the paper. New insight and not new information is what I mentioned to you earlier. Don't surprise the reader with uh, new information in your conclusion. If that was never referenced anywhere or never researched. If you have new information to present, uh, add it to the discussion or other appropriate section of the paper, not in the conclusion. Although not uh, the actual information introduced may be, uh, may be totally not supporting your problem statement, then you, you do not need to discuss that because it's going to be another discussion that cannot be justified from the data that you have collected. So you've got to be very careful what is relevant, what is irrelevant for your discussion. Okay, so that is the, the main uh, part when we talk about being uh, writing, okay? Very concise uh, communication for conclusion, short format, high impact, definitive findings. So that's the main thing that you see in the conclusion. So beside the conclusion, there are also other areas that you need to look at in a paper. Uh, the most common that all of us use a lot is using the appendices, proofreading, looking at your grammar, citation and, and bibliography and references. All this is as important. So if you look at the appendices that is used in most research papers, uh, your research paper uh, must be complete without the appendices and it must contain all the information, including table, diagram and results uh, necessary to address a research problem. So the key point to remember is when you are when you need an appendix, what kind of information that can go in the appendix and what kind of information that can go in the main text, okay? So remember when you are writing an, an appendix, the information is non-essential, meaning to say, if you have dropped the information, it's still okay. So any non-essential information can go in the appendix. So if we, we remove this paper, there's no problem at all. But if you remove the appendix and the paper falls apart, then you have a problem. It means your, your info in the appendix is sitting in the wrong place. So it contains, appendices contains uh, supplementary materials that is not essential part of the text itself, but which may be helpful in providing a more uh, comprehensive understanding of the research problem or uh, the information which is uh, maybe too much for the body of the paper. For example, your, if you're doing a quantitative research, you've got your SPSS results and analysis that can go pages and pages. You don't want to put the whole SPSS raw analysis into your main paper. You may pick a few important tables that comes out and put it in. The rest, selectively, that also not everything, selectively, you can put certain things in the appendix. So a separate appendix should be used for uh, each distinct topic or set of data and, and not dump everything in one appendix. You may have so many appendix that is very precise. This is for which part of data, this is for descriptive, this is for the, the which area of the analysis that you want to put in. So you need to be very, very precise uh, on each appendix that you're using. So it is, Appropriate to include appendixes when the incorporation of materials in the body of the work would make it 
uh, poorly structured because it's too much of info to put, then you just dump it at the appendixes. So you'll see that a lot, especially if you're writing a dissertation or thesis, then you see a lot of these appendixes uh, actually happen, uh, is, is included. So when considering whether to include uh, con uh, content in appendix, keep in mind that, that uh, it is usually a good practice to include your raw data only in the appendix, as I've said. If you see a lot of the latest journal, they even allow you now to upload the raw data in a, sep in, uh, in a separate attachment. So, so this is another thing uh, that is being introduced by many journals, meaning you have access to this source raw data for more in-depth analysis if you want to do. So any tables and figures uh, included in the appendix should be numbered as a separate sequence from the main paper. So remember, don't just put a table without number, table one, table two, figure one, figure two. So you have to number it uh, accordingly. So, so these are all, these table and figures are considered as a non-textual element and it should be arranged in a certain sequential numbering. But uh, consistently, if you're using A, B, C, let me say table A, table B, table B, table 1.1, table 1.2, so you number it correctly. If you have more than uh, three appendices, uh, consider listing them on a separate page at the beginning of your paper. If you've got one or two, is fine, but if you've got a lot of appendix, you may have one page that say appendices, then you have like a table of content of the appendix. Appendix one is what, appendix two is what, so you list them out because it is easy reference for those who want to read the paper. The appendix can be a good place uh, to put maps, uh, photographs, certain diagrams, and other uh, non-textual uh, uh, elements. So if you feel that it will help the reader to understand the context of your paper. But remember that the paper should still be understandable without them. That's why it's an appendix. An appendix should be streamlined and not loaded with a lot of information. Okay, so if you have a very long and complex appendix, it is a good idea to break it down into separate uh, appendices, allowing the reader to find the relevant information quickly from the paper. So there are some examples of, uh, of contents for appendices here uh, that I've just discussed. What are the things that you can actually put? So the detail, you, you can see the list here that, that I mentioned to you earlier. So do not, include anything that is weak in the appendix bit. Okay, you've got to be, uh, you've got to ensure that it's not going to distract the reader from your actual paper, but by you dumping so many photographs, let's say, you open at the back, there's about 20, 30 photographs inside there. So don't do that. Be careful. What are the relevant information that you want to include? Format it correctly. Just follow the, the reference style. If it's APA, if it's Harvard, how should the table be? How should the tables or figure be designed in the appendix? So it's all there in your reference uh, guideline. So you list them accordingly. You begin on a new page. You don't have appendix coming in the middle of the page. You continue appendix A, B, appendix A in one page, appendix B in another page. You try to put it in a different page, even though you use half a page, but the next, next appendix will actually move to the next page, not go below that first appendix, okay? And then uh, precisely uh, list them accordingly with, with proper, uh, page numbering. So another important aspect uh, of, of writing the paper when you're concluding the paper, once you've completed the paper is also checking your paper, your proofreading of your paper. Be sure you have uh, revised the larger aspect of your text. Don't make corrections uh, at the sentence and word level if you still need to work on the overall focus development and arrangement of the papers of section. So normally you do the overall paper first Okay, all the info you want is there, the sequence is there, completed, okay, then only you go to the actual proofreading. So don't start with the proofreading because if you start with the proofreading, then you realize that, hey, the, the actual paper is disjointed. So what's the point of wasting your time doing the proofreading? So don't start with the proofreading. You make sure the papers in the context are good, well arranged, okay, the points you want to ask is all is there, okay, then look at the, the contents in terms of the language editing. So set, uh, ensure that your, your proofreading uh, is done correctly after that. So establishing some distance between uh, the writing of the paper and proofreading is also important because if you have read the paper 
20, 30 times your own paper. You've written so many times, arranging, rearranging so many times. The probability is you will not see your mistake. So what is so how do you avoid that? Put it aside after a while, okay, a few days, then you come back. That's one option. Second option is get someone to read for you and check your work. If you do it continuously, rearranging everything and then doing the proofreading at the same time, you will miss your mistake unless someone looks at it and say, hey, this is not correct. And sometimes you have read this so many times, you never realize the mistake that you've made. So you eliminate uh, uh, any uh, unnecessary words before looking for mistakes. Okay, so if you think certain section or paragraph is, is, is not needed, think, rearrange it first. Okay, throughout your paper, you should try to avoid using uh, uh, phrases that is that does not work. Okay, don't try to be bombastic. Okay, just to make the paper looks good. Okay, try to be more precise in your language and easier to easier for, for anyone to proofread. Okay, so know what to look for. Make a list of uh, mistakes that you need to watch out for based upon the, the comments or draft that, that was given to you or you know your common mistake that you always make. So this will help you uh, making uh, some repeated patterns of mistake, which you don't realize sometimes it can be uh, uh, American sp spelling versus UK spelling. Nothing wrong, but it's wrong. You have to decide which one are you going to use. If you're here in Malaysia, we use UK. So, but in some journal, it, it can be uh, American uh, English. Uh, so there are some tips and uh, tricks for proofreading here. Uh, it depends. It depends on which generation are you. So if you are the old generation, then maybe you may say, oh, I'm more comfortable editing in a printout than on a screen. Okay, so some people say, no, I can do the whole editing, open the document, put your words on, click your, your review uh, uh, and let the tracks on your tracking and then start editing. And some they can't, they have to actually scribble in the printout before making the mistake, uh, before, uh, correcting the mistake. So depending on you, read out loud. This can be helpful. I do that as well. So when I'm editing something, if I do it silently, the tendency of me making mistake. So I tend to read out. When I read out and I'm hearing it, then I realize this is not right. This does not sound right. Then you know that you have to make some changes. So it's good to read out loud. Of course, you have to do it in, in a quiet room where there's no other disturbance. Use a ruler or blank sheet of paper to cover up the lines below the ones you are reading. So this is another way so that uh, this technique will keep you from, from skipping over possible mistake because you tend to read fast and you will tend to skip. So if you use that, you cover the other section, you just focus on the area that you want to focus on. Circle or highlight uh, every punctuation mark in your paper. So this forces you to uh, pay attention to each mark you use and, and to question its purpose in each sentence. So this is another style of, uh, of actually uh, proofreading. You can also use the search function in the computer uh, to find mistake. So if you use the, you know, remember the, the control F button. And if you think there's some common mistake, especially some phrases or spelling, the UK spelling and English spelling, if you realize, ah, you made error in this spelling, you don't have to go one by one. Just use the, the uh, search button, uh, find and replace button, and immediately it replaces some of the common words that you realize, ah, you made this mistake. You don't have to go one by one looking for the mistake. Use the search function and replace button. If you tend to make uh, many mistakes, check separately for each kind of error, okay? So which is the most common mistake you make uh, and then uh, look at it one by one. Uh, is it your, your tenses are always seem to be wrong? So you, so you need to see what are the common things that you always make and then be cautious of it. Uh, and with using a computer spell checker or reading backwards word by word. So this is another uh, style. Some people, uh, uh, it works to some, for me, no. The reading backward thing does not work. Reading backward doesn't mean that uh, you read uh, backwards uh, uh, directly. What it means by backward is you, you read, let's say, conclusion chapter first. This for a proofreading, uh, not the content. You read the conclusion first, then you read maybe... Uh, uh, the discussion, then you go the other way around so that you're not biased in the 
in the in the contents, but you're just focused on the sentences, whether grammatically is correct, spelling is correct. So, so that's one approach of actually doing it. But of course, don't forget, your computer has its own uh, spell checker. There's a lot of application now. Grammar, Grammarly is another one. Uh, you, if you're subscribed to it, uh, you can actually paste your article there and it gives you the first cut of uh, edits for you to change. It doesn't mean it's always correct, but at least it picks up some of the common uh, mistakes. Uh, get some distance uh, when you are actually uh, um, doing the proofreading and, and actually editing, which what I mentioned to you uh, uh, earlier. So all these things that you see here is uh, areas that you can actually focus on when you are trying to uh, edit your paper. And lastly, here, the few things I've just put on the screen here, just to keep uh, tab whenever you are doing uh, uh checking on your proofreading get okay, the common mistake you always make uh, you make effect effect apostrophe when do you use capitalization uh, so all these are common thing. i'm not going to run through the list here but I'm just putting the points here uh, you you will get access to this uh, slide but uh remember uh some of this mistake so once you know that you always make a similar mistake look out for those mistakes because the probability high is you may have those mistakes in the paper. All right, so now I will hand over to Ms. Fairo Nizan to take us through the, the next uh, section. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Prabhupada. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. For today's topic, I will highlight on the importance of citing your resources used to write your research, acknowledging where the information you use comes from to avoid presenting other people's work on your own. We will also highlight on the annotated bibliography. Okay, citing resources. When you cite your resource, you should learn how to use the appropriate style or standard or guide, whether it is APA, Turabian, Chicago, MLA, and others. So you need to be 100% sure which styles you need to use and you just follow according to the rules for each styles. Okay, you have to reference all the resources that you use, whether it's a book, it's a journal article, conference, a YouTube video, interviews, whatever you use to write your research, whether you put directly or you derive the idea, you must cite in your you must cite all these resources. Okay, if you are quoting from a source, then the original source should also be cited and the word or phrase placed in quote very clearly. So when people read your research, your writing, people are 100% sure which one is your own words and which one comes from the resource. Okay, when you paraphrase, if an idea or information from another source even you put it your own words in it you still need to credit the source next slide please importance of citing your sources so citation shows your reader where you obtain your materials okay and offer the opportunity to obtain additional information about the research problem under investigation so properly citing the works of others is important. Why? Because it allows others to locate the material that you have used. Citation to other sources help readers expand their knowledge on a topic. Okay. It also, when you cite other people's work and ideas, it will indicate that you have conducted comprehensive review on the literature on your topic. And therefore, you are operating for an, from an informative perspective. So this will increase the credibility as the author of the work. Okay. Other researchers' ideas can be used to reinforce your arguments. It can be used as an evidence to your arguments. Or if you disagree with them, it can act as a position from which to argue an alternative viewpoint. Okay, ideas are considered intellectual properties. 
So you need to be 100% sure that you cite it properly because failure to cite other people's intellectual property it will cause a big um, problem, especially in your reputation and result, it may result in some legal action. So it is important to get the habit of citing all the sources that you use. Okay, in academic writing, you are required to identify for your reader which idea, facts, theories, concepts are yours and which one are derived from the research and thoughts of others. So whether you summarize it or you paraphrase or you use direct quotes, and it is not your own original idea. So the source need to be acknowledged. You do not need to cite material which is accepted as common knowledge. But sometimes you, know, you are not sure, you are in doubt. So the best is just to put it in your citation to cite it all. Next slide, please. Okay, annotated bibliography. What is an annotated bibliography? An annotated bibliography is a list of citation to books, articles, and documents. Each citation is followed by a brief descriptive and evaluative paragraph. The, that is called the annotation. So as you can see on the, on the screen, there's some examples. Okay, the purpose of the annotation is to inform the reader of the relevance, accuracy, and quality of the sources that you have cited. So an annotated bibliography allows you to see what has been done in the literature and where your own research can fit into it. Okay, next slide, please. Writing an annotated bibliography can help you gain good perspective on what is being said about your topic. A good annotated bibliography should address the main focus or purpose of the work, usefulness or relevance to your research topic, special features of the work that were unique or helpful, background and credibility of the author, conclusion or observation reached by the author and also conclusion or observation reached by you as the writer of the research. Next, please. Good annotated bibliography also encourage you to think critically. Okay, think critically about the content of the work you are using. They are placed within the broader field of the study and also their realization to your own research assumption and ideas. So it will give you an opportunity to widen the field to consider and include key digital multimedia or archival materials among your review of the literature. It situates the study and topic in a continuing professional conversation. It also provides an opportunity for others to decide whether the source will help be helpful for them in their own research. So it could also help interested researchers determine whether they are interested in a topic by providing background information and an idea of the kind of scholarly investigation they have been conducted in a particular area of study. It's also a good strategy to help build your bibliography is to identify several key scholarly sources and review the sources cited by the author. Often this will lead you quickly to related sources about the topic that you are writing. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, these slides and the next slides are resources for lesson nine. Consists of books and online sources for further reading and references. So thank you very much, and I'll pass back the session to Prof. Thank you so much, Farunizan. So that concludes uh, our, our session uh, today. And uh, I would like to open the floor now uh, to anyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, any comments or feedback uh, based on your own experience of, of, of writing papers, uh, especially in the writing, the conclusion part of the of the paper, the conclusion part, remember it differs from one discipline to another. 
the science related disciplines, if you see the journal in journals, the conclusion is very precise. It may be just one line. The one sentence can be a, just a short paragraph. But if you see social science paper is slightly longer compared to the science uh, papers. So depending on your field, depending on the publication, you could look at a sample of the publication and then decide how you want to design. But the fundamentals that what we have discussed today is the same in any uh, publication. So is there any questions from anyone? No questions? So we are, as I've said, today is the uh, last part of our of our nine uh, sessions that we have started from January, um, right from choosing a topic on preparing to write, then we talked about how to design your abstract, then we moved on to the different section of the paper, the introduction, the literature review, the methodology, results and discussion, and then today on the conclusion and other sections. So this is the first series of workshop that we've organized, uh, and we will be having the second round of series uh, soon. Um, and uh, if you think there's something that you want us to, to look at or help uh, in, in conducting a, a session, then do let us know. We are, we are open to, to design something uh, for you. Okay, so if there is no question, so I will end the session today. Uh, for those of you who have been consistently coming for our session, have registered for our session, uh, we will we will uh, issue a, a certificate for, for those of you who have actually come into the session. Uh, we have a, uh, all the registrations are recorded. Um, we also view the YouTube sessions. Uh, remember, all the sessions are recorded, so we can actually see the analytics that comes from the YouTube. How many of them are looking at it? Where are they looking from? Uh, so all these things will be will be good for us to to decide uh, how do we structure this presentation in the future and when is the best slot for us to have the session. So if you have any further ideas, please do not hesitate to contact. So at the end of the session, remember, uh, you feel, feel free to contact any one, three of us if you have any issue. It's not just for the period of the session, anytime. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude our nine-week session uh, since February. And thank you for all your support in coming. Uh, some of you have, have been there for almost every session. So thank you for the support. And we will continuously organize uh, more important sessions uh, moving forward. So once again, have a good weekend, stay safe, and I will see you in our future sessions. Bye-bye. Thank you, Fyronis. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone.